let's get uh, uh, back to uh, space complexity. Um, so what, uh, just to review what we've been doing um, on, from last lecture, which feels like a long time ago, but it was only two days ago. Um, we uh, uh, were looking at um, those three theorems, which all had this basically the same proof. One was the ladder about the ladder problem of uh, where you're trying to see if you can get from one string to another string, changing one symbol at a time. Um, and uh, all of the strings were in the language of some finite automaton, or you had some reasonable rule for uh, saying which are the valid strings or which are not. And then uh, we built on that idea. We showed Savage's theorem that going from any non-deterministic machine to a de deterministic machine only squares the amount of space. And then um, we finally uh, proved that TQBF, uh, this problem about quantified Boolean formulas and testing whether they are true, uh, that that problem is complete for P space. Um, so we're going to build off of that last, last theorem today and talk about uh, one other complete problem um, and also uh, show a connection between uh, P space and testing uh, which side uh, can win in certain kinds of games. Um, so, um, and then the, at the end of the lecture, we will, the second half of the lecture, we'll talk about um, diving deeper into space complexity. We're gonna talk about a different um, uh, part of the parameter space where instead of looking at polynomial space, we're gonna talk about what happens if you have logarithmic space, which is another natural uh, point to look at for, from, for, for space complexity, but we'll get to that uh, after, the, uh, after the break. Okay, um, uh, talk about game complexity and games. Um, so when I was little, uh, we used to play, me and my sisters would play a game called Geography. I don't know if how many of you have heard it, or maybe it go, uh, goes under a different name. Um, but uh, it's, it was a game about, basically about words and places. And it has a very simple um, set of rules. Um, let's say there were two people. You take turns picking names of places. Um, and then each person has to pick a place which starts with the, the letter that the previous person's place ended with. So for example, you know, you have two people playing, um, perhaps you have, you know, you agree on some starting place like a major city nearby like Boston. Um, so one, you know, one player, the first player picks Boston. And then after that, the next player has to pick a place that starts with N because Boston ends with N. And so maybe Nebraska uh, would be a possible response to Boston. And then the first player would have to respond to that with a place that starts with an A because Nebraska ends with an A. It's like maybe Alaska, uh, which also starts with A, ends with A. So uh, then Arkansas maybe would be a nat reasonable response to that. And then that ends with S, um, so uh, San Francisco, and then so on and so on. Um, and uh, of course you want to pr forbid people from reusing uh, names because then you'll just get into a loop, you know, saying Alaska, Alaska, Alaska won't make the game very interesting. So you have to forbid uh, that possibility. Uh, names cannot be reused. They can be used at most once. And then, um, so eventually one side or the other is going to run out of names uh, and not have a, either because of their lack of their geographical knowledge, or maybe you've just exhausted all the possibilities and uh, will we'll not have a response and that person will be stuck. And that person is the loser. Um, the other person has won the game. So the objective is to try to avoid getting stuck. Um, so let's just take a look. Um, I'm gonna think about that game in a somewhat slightly more uh, abstracted, formalized way. Um, so you write down all of the legitimate places. Um, they become nodes of a graph, such as I've shown here. And then you draw an edge from one node to another, if, um, that, uh, if that corresponds to a legal move in the game, a legal step of the game. So you know, Boston connects to places that start with N. 
like New York and Nebraska. Um, so the first person might pick Boston, the second person might pick either of these two. Um, and then back to the first person, if they pick Nebraska, they could pick Arkansas, they can pick Alaska, and so on, just as I described. Believe it or not, we actually played this game. I can remember playing this game when I was a kid. That was, of course, before we had um, uh, you know, League of Legends and other fun, fun stuff. But this is what kids used to do. Uh, so anyway, um, um, so just to re get it down on the slide, the rules are, you will, we'll, we'll assume we have two players. We'll call them player one and player two. Player one goes first. Um, and they take turns picking places that start with the letter which ended the previous place. Not, no repeats allowed. And the first person stuck, player, the first player stuck loses. We know the person who doesn't have a, a move to make. So what we're gonna look at um, today is a, is a generalized version of that where we kind of um, just gonna take away the names but just leave the underlying graph. And we're gonna call, going call that generalized geography. So here, um, that can be played on any directed graph. You take away the names of the edges, uh, the names of the nodes. Now you just have a, some arbitrary graph. Um, you're gonna designate a particular node as the starting node. And then the players take turns following those edges. Um, and uh, what uh, you're, because you're gonna forbid having any loops, uh, reusing any, um, any nodes, uh, what you end up doing is working together, you're gonna to be constructing a simple path in that graph. Simple path just follows those edges and uh, never intersect itself. Um, and the first person, the first player to be stuck is the loser. So the other one is the winner. Okay, so that's, we're gonna call that generalized geography. And we're gonna look at the computational complexity of deciding for a given graph and starting point, which side would win if both uh, players played optimally as best, uh, the best possible, okay? And we'll name that problem GG or look at its associated language. So here is a graph and the starting node. And you wanna say um, that pair is in the language GG, if the first player, player one, um, who must play at that node A um, to start off with, has a forced win um, uh, in that uh, ge generalized geography game on that graph starting at A, okay? Where, again, what I mean by a forced win, I'm not gonna define this formally, though we could do that, it's not hard to do, but a forced win, also, it's also called a winning strategy, um, that just means that if both sides play optimal, they pay the best possible, um, not up their capability, I mean the, absolutely the best possible play, um, then that uh, player one uh, would still win. There's nothing that player two can do to uh, prevent player one from winning um, if player one has a winning strategy or a forced win. Um, you may have seen, for example, uh, there were examples of this that, I mean, I don't even know if they still exist, but it used to be in the newspaper. They used to be examples of chess boards. And they would say, you know, if, if they would start from a certain position and they would say white to win in three. And so that means white has a forced win. No matter what black does, white is gonna end up winning. But you have to think of what the strategy is. It may not be so obvious to think through what are the right moves that white makes. But the point is that no matter what black would do, white would end up winning. Um, and what you can show, we're not going to do that, but for um, a class of games that includes this generalized geography, um, either one side or the other is going to be guaranteed to have a forced win. That's not necessarily true for all possible games, obviously, um, but for a large class of games, um, in one side or the other is guaranteed to have a winning strategy or a forced win. Okay. So let's just review that because this is gonna be essential for you know, the first half of the lecture to understand what we mean by a game and what we mean by one side or the other to have a forced win. Okay, so let's, let's just, uh, oh yeah. And what we're gonna show is that GG is P-space complete. That the problem of giving one of these graphs and a starting point, figuring out 
does player one have a forced win or is it player two that has a forced win? Um, which side is guaranteed to win under optimal play? That's a piece-based complete problem. Um, and so let's do a little check-in on that. And so I'll, I'm going to give you a very small example uh, of a generalized geography game. And you have to figure out whether it's player one or player two that has the forced win, the, the winning strategy, or maybe neither or both. Those are the four options. Okay, and you understand player one has to play here because that's the starting place of this generalized geography game. So then it's up to player two to continue on. All right, so let's um, launch that poll. Uh, you'll have to think about it a little bit. Um, and uh, let me know what you think. Which side has a forced win? Which player makes the first move? It's player one makes the first move. And player one plays, as I showed you here, this is player one playing at A. So player one picks A, picks, and then player two has to pick one of these two. Okay, all right. I think we're gonna end the poll. Everybody's in, pick something. Um, you, you, you guys <laughs> did not do well on this poll. Uh, at least not too many of you picked D. That's, that's, cheer, that's, a, that's a little reassuring because you can't have both players having a forced win. I did say that in games of this kind, one side or the other is going to have a forced win. So C is not a very good choice either. Um, so you're, maybe you should spend less time reading your email and more time listening to the lecture. Uh, um, the actual correct answer is B. Player two, um, which is obviously a, was a, is a minority position here. Player two has the forced win. Let's understand why. Um, so player one plays here. As I said, that's the, big, that's the first move. Player two can either take the upper node or the lower node, okay? Player two takes the upper node. Then player one has no choice but to take the rightmost node. And now, there's no more move for player two. Uh, so player two will lose um, if player two takes the upper node, the upper choice there, because player two will go here, player one will go there, and it'll be game over, and player one will have won because player two was stuck. However, player two had another choice. Um, uh, player two had another choice. Um, player two could have also gone down here. Um, so player two, uh, if, if it played down here, um, things are looking a lot better for player two because player two goes here, player one's move is forced, goes here, but now there's another move left uh, that player two could make. So play, player so two goes here, one goes there, player two goes up there, and now player one is stuck. So at player two's choice, um, player two can make a move which will end up causing player one to get stuck. And so because it, you know, th that's the nature of what we mean by uh, having a winning strategy, there is some way to guarantee if you're playing optimally and you're certainly playing optimally means you'll take that lower move, uh, then you will um, take that. So uh, under uh, optimal play, player two will win this game. And so player two has a winning strategy. It has a forced win. Okay. Um, so I, I see. So I, I'm not going to define playing optimally. I'm going to, you know, th there's some questions here about that. About that. That's, um, you know, you can think about. I'm going to. I'm going to leave it. Um, uh, you know, uh, so, somewhat informal. Um, but we could make that all precise, I, I don't think it would be clarifying to, to go through a, a, a precise definition of that. Um, uh, you know, you, you can just think, we don't even have to think about it in terms of optimal play. You, you can say that there is um, a, uh, for every, uh, a, um, a, you say a player has a forced win if, uh, they have 
moves that they could make in response to every possible move the opponent could make, uh, that'll guarantee that they will end up winning. So it doesn't necessarily, even, we don't even have to talk about optimality here. Just talk about every possible opponent. Every possible opponent is going to lose to somebody who, um, uh, you know, has a, has a winning strategy and, pl and follows that strategy. Okay. Um, okay, I can see there was some confusion about who was going first and so on. I'm glad we, that was part of the reason I gave this check in just so hopefully to clear up some of those points. Um, so player one plays here, then player two uh, goes. And I, I got some comments that some people were confused about what does it mean for the first, uh, uh, where, where does the first person move? Okay, hopefully that's, that's uh, clearer. All right, so let's move on. Because we're going to make, we're going to be spending a while um, proving something about generalized geography and these graphs. Um, okay, so let's let's continue. So in order to make a connection between um, games and complexity, we're going to need to. Um, uh, talk about a problem, one that we've actually related to one that we've already seen, where we can reformulate that problem as a game. And that's gonna be a problem on quantified Boolean formulas called the formula game. Okay, so this is a different game now, um, not one that you're likely to end up playing, but in, 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 in a sense in which you'll see, this is a, still a reasonable game where two pl players can play against one another and one of them is gonna end up winning and one of them is going to end up having, uh, uh, one of the other will have a winning strategy. Um, so let's understand what the game is. Uh, the game is played. Uh, you, uh, the, the the game is played on a formula. So you so you write down a quantified Boolean formula. Remember we talked about that uh, you know for several lectures now. Uh, you know it's a bunch of quantum variables with quantifiers. And um, uh, then there's the part that has no quantifiers, um, which you know uh, you can always put into conjunctive normal form if you want. But for, for the purposes of this discussion so far, it doesn't matter. Later on, we'll actually want it to be in in, quant in, in, in CNF. But okay. But but for now, we just have some formula, and associated to that formula, there is a game in a very natural sense. So first of all, let me. There are going to be two players, but now the names of those players are gonna be player exist and player for all. Okay, and the way, the way that this is how the game goes. The, uh, the player exist, but both players are gonna be picking values of, for variables. They're gonna say, you know, variable X1 is true, variable X2 is false, variable X3 is false, variable X4 is true, and, and they're going to be, that, that's how the moves of the game go. They're just assigning values to variables. So that in the end, all of the variables have been assigned a value, a Boolean value. And so we end up with an assignment. But uh, before we get to that stage, um, which players get to pick which variables? And the way it works is the exist player is going to assign values to the exist variables. So exist will pick x1 and x3 and assign them val values. The for all player is going to pick the very va assign values to the variables that have a for all quantifier attached. So in this case would be x2 would be um, uh, the, the, the for all player will pick the value for x the x2 variable. Um, fading out here. Okay. Now, um, so and the order of play is according to the order of the appearance of the quantifiers in the formula. So the way I have it written out in this particular formula, it's exist x1. So exist will pick the value for x1. Then it's for all's turn. For all will pick the value of x2. Then it's going to be exist picking the value for x3. Um, and, and so on. Until they get to the end and all of the variables have been assigned a value by one side or the other. And now the game is over, okay? So, um, 
What's left is to understand who has won at that point. Um, and the way we uh, say who has won is exist wins if in the end, this part psi, which is the part without quantifiers, ended up being satisfied by those, um, by that assignment that the two players together ended up picking. And then for all will win if that uh, part of the formula is not satisfied. So let me just write that down here. After the variables have been assigned values, we determine the winner. Exist wins if the assignment that they cooperate together built, they built cooperatively together, uh, satisfied Psi, and otherwise for all wins, if it doesn't satisfy Psi, okay? So you, you kind of think about it this way. You know, exist is picking the values of those variables. He's trying to make this uh, part of the formula satisfied, trying to satisfy this part of the formula. For all is picking values, but she's trying to make this part of the formula unsatisfied. So they're, you know, they're uh, in opposition to one another. And um, in the end, one of them is going to have succeeded and the other one will have failed. Uh, and now thinking about it as a game, one side, depending upon the formula, one side or the other is going to have the ability to dominate the other one and always win. Um, and so the question is, which side has that um, ability to always win? Which side has the winning strategy? Uh, of course, it'll depend upon the formula. Some formulas, it'll be the exist player who has the winning strategy. In other formulas, it'll be the for all player who has the winning strategy. And computationally, we'd like to make that determination. Which side is gonna win um, uh, you know, for a given formula? And there's a very, very nice and actually very easy um, and simple way to understand that because we've already run into that problem before. Um, the problem of determining which side has a force, force win is exactly the same thing as determining whether this quantified Boolean formula is true. Because the exist player has a force win when that formula game on that, um, on that formula, um, let me say it again. The exist player has a force win when that formula is true. Um, so if this quantified Boolean formula were a true quantified Boolean formula, then exist is guaranteed to be able to win that game if it, if it plays its hand right. If this is a false formula, for all, the for all player will always be able to win um, if, it, if it plays its hand right. Okay, so um, why is that? And it really follows kind of almost, you know, without doing any work at all. This is kind of a, you know, the, 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 this proof, even though it looks superficially like it might be not so easy to prove, it, it follows for a very simple reason, because the meaning of what it means for exist to have a winning strategy is exactly captured by the semantics of the quantifiers. Let's see what that means. What does it mean that exist has a forced win? Let's say up here. That means that, well, exist has a move that it could make. That it exists can um, pick some value for x1. So there is some move for x, for, uh, there is some way to assign x1 so that no matter what the opponent does, no matter what for all does, there's going to be a response that it exists can make. Um, some, some assignment to X3. Um, uh, so that no matter what for all does, there's going to be an assignment to the, to the next var variable. Um, and so on and so on, so that this thing ends up being true. So let me just say that again. Somehow I didn't feel it came out very clear. Uh, so exist has a winning strategy exactly when there is some assignment to X1 that exists can make such that no matter what assignment that for all makes to X2, there is some assignment to X3 um, such that no matter what assignment that um, for all makes to X4 and so on, makes this thing true. That's what it means for exist to have a winning strategy. 
That's exactly what the quantifiers are saying in the first place. So even really without doing anything, you can see that exists has a winning strategy means exactly the same thing as the formula, the quantified being formula being true. So making the test of whether uh, which side has a winning strategy is the same as testing whether the formula is true. Okay. Um, so let's let me let me try to turn to the chat now um, before before we move on to anything else. Um, all right. Uh, whoops. Uh, here we go. Um, Okay, so I'm getting some questions about the order of play and about the alternation of the quantifiers here. So the way I'm showing it is that the quantifiers always alternate. It exists for all, exists for all. That doesn't really matter. Um, you know, you can have several exists in a row and then that would correspond to exist making several moves in a row um, before turning it over to for all. Uh, but alternatively, um, we could just add extra variables which don't play any role inside. And um, they're just kind of dummy variables that serve as spacers. So if you have two exists in a row and you don't like that, you can just add, add a for all of some variable that you never see again in between. Um, so you can always get it to be alternating if you want. Uh, so, um, Okay, um, also question the difference between fa, phi uh, and psi. So psi is the part here that does not have any quantifiers. So the way we always write down our Q QBFs is they're leading quantifiers with the variables, which, uh, you know, and all variables have to be within the scope of one of the quantifiers, quantified variables. Um, so, you know, there are no free variables that are unquantified in our QBFs. Um, and so the, there's a, you know, all of these QBFs have a run of quantifiers and then a part without quantifiers where there's the sort of the Boolean, Boolean logic part. Um, psi here is the Boolean logic part and phi is the whole thing together with the quantifiers. Um, so, um, okay, I'm not sure I understand some of these, why not have the for all player have a forced win? The for, for all player might have a for all forced win so see, it, one side or the other is guaranteed to have a forced win. So if exist does not have a forced win, then, then for all will have a forced win. That, you know, I'm not going to prove that, but th that's a fairly simple proof by induction, which I'm not going to go through. Just take it as a fact. Somebody's asking, why does for all want to not satisfy the, uh, this, this expression, the, the side part? Well, I mean, that's the way we set up the game. Um, you know, in order to make this correspond to TQBF, um, the, you know, just the truth of the of this uh, of this expression, we want to make exist try to satisfy the, the, the this part, and for all try to unsatisfy make it not satisfied. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure because <laughs> that's what works. I'm not sure what else, whatever, what other why I can answer there. Okay, so somebody. I'm going to answer some of the you know most basic questions here. Somebody's asking, how do we know how many variables to use? So the the variables are, are the variables of the formula. So somebody's going to hand you a formula that's going to have x1 to x10, whatever that formula has, some number of variables. And so that game is going to have 10 moves. You know, if the if the quantifiers alternate, then the moves will alternate. But whatever the pattern of the quantifiers is going to be the pattern of the moves. So exist is going to follow the, um, you know, the, the places where the exist quantifier occurs, and for all is going to follow the places where the for all quantifier occurs. So if you have, you know, exist for all, exist for all, exist will move first, then for all will move, then exist will move, then for all will move. Together they're picking values to their respective variables, with with their opposing goals. Exist is trying to make the um, the psi part satisfied. For all is trying to avoid making it satisfied, to make, to, to make, make the assignment not satisfy that part. And if you think about what that means, just in terms of the meaning of that, um, that it's going to mean exactly the same thing that the formula is true. 
Um, so anyway, if you don't, let's see, I don't know if there's any more questions that I can try to answer here. Um, Well, so it's still about the numbers of variables. The um, you're, you're, each formula is going to define a different game. You see the formula. So the formula, however big, it may have fifty variables. It may have two variables. Well, we'll do an example. Maybe that'll help. Um, uh, one, the next check-in, which is coming up for pretty soon, might actually be now. Uh, we'll give you an example. Um, so then we'll. we'll see who's, who's understanding and who's not. Okay, so let's continue here. Um, so, so therefore the problem of determining does exist have a forced win is exactly the TQBF problem because exist has a forced win exactly when the formula is true. Um, and what we're gonna show is that TQBF is a polynomial time reducible to generalized geography. But it's conceptually, we're going to think about TQBF now as a game, because that's how geography is, generalized geography is set up. So we're going to, given a formula like this, we're going to construct an instance of generalized geography. We're going to construct a graph where play on that graph is going to mimic play in the formula game. So making the moves in that graph are going to correspond to setting variables true and false, because the graph is going to be specially designed to, to force that behavior. Okay, so I think we have a check-in coming in. Yeah, so let's just see how, um, I, I, I suggest you pay attention to this check-in and really try to think about it and solve it because I think that'll help you make the connection between the truth uh, of the formula and exist having a winning strategy. Okay, so, so if you take this formula here, here's, you know, this is some particular formula, exist x for all y, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's going to be associated to that formula, a formula game, where first exist moves, assigns a value for x, and depending upon that value, for all is going to move, and it's going to assign a value for y. And after that's done, this part here is either going to be true or false. It's either going to be satisfied or unsatisfied. Um, and I want to know, can exist always find a way, can it, does, to, to, to guarantee that this part is going to be satisfied or can for all always get, find a way to guarantee that this part is not satisfied. Okay, so it's, you have to stare, you have to look at this uh, formula to understand which side is going to end up succeeding. Um, so you, you have to, if you're not clear on the rules, look back here. Exist is trying to make this part satisfied. For all is trying to make this part unsatisfied. But they, neither of them has the, you know, the totally upper hand because exist is picking one of the variables for all is picking the other variable. But they're doing it in a certain order. Okay, first exist is gonna pick, then it for all is gonna pick. Okay, so that's the way the game works. Exist picks a value, then for all picks a value, and then you see who wins. So who wins? Who's guaranteed to win? Um, you know, can, can you make sure it exists always wins or can we make sure that it for all always wins for this particular formula? So it's just, there's just two variables here. And you can think about this in either of two ways, strictly speaking, purely as a game, or you can look at, understand whether that formula is true or not. Um, th th they're equivalent ways of looking at, at the problem. In fact, in a certain sense, it's the same. That's what I'm trying to trying to get across. Thinking about this as a game or thinking about it in terms of quantifiers doesn't make any difference. Um, okay. Almost done here. So, all right, last call. Closing the poll. Okay, I think th this one you got you did, you 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 did pretty well on. So yeah, the correct answer is the for all player has a uh, winning strategy, has a forced win, uh, and um, also similarly the expression um, is phi is is false because you know if you try to find some x such that no matter what y you pick, um, this is going to be true. 
this is going to be satisfied, you're out of luck. Because you know, if you make x true, well, um, then uh, uh, um, if you make x true, now I'm confused. Uh, if you make x true, what is going on? If you make x true, then uh, y, oh, so if you make x true, then uh, x bar is false. Um, so y bar has to be true. Uh, um, now I'm completely confused. Oh no, oh, my see. If you make x true, it has to work for all y. So this thing is clearly false. If you make x true, um, uh, then, then, th then this x bar is gonna be false. And it's not the case that for every y, of the setting for y, because y is forced here. Y is gonna have to be true. Well, y bar is gonna have to be true, so y is gonna have to be false. So if you make it very clearly, but if you make, if you, and now if you, if you try again to make x false, um, maybe that's a one to think about first. If you make x false, so you're gonna be stuck on the first clause because you have, it has to work for both settings of y. But maybe thinking about it as a game is better. You know, if you, um, no matter what X does, a Y is gonna find, have a way of making one of those two clauses unsatisfied. So if X is true, Y can, uh, uh, can set itself, y, we, we can set Y to make the second clause uh, unsatisfied. And if X is false, we can find Y can be assigned to make the first clause unsatisfied. Um, so anyway, um, the right answer is uh, the for all player. Uh, has a winning strategy here. In, in the end of the day, it's not critical that you understand this correspondence, but the, but you have to then, if you don't quite understand that, you're gonna have to take on faith that the formula game is the same as TQBF because that's what we're gonna use. And by the way, I would like to also mention here that, um, that this correspondence between uh, games and quantifiers is something that mathematicians use all the time. Um, because if you, have a, if you have some expression which comes up often in mathematics where there are you know, a whole run of quantifiers you know, in front of some, uh, some statement, it's really kind of hard for anybody uh, to really uh, get a feeling for what that means. If you have like six alternating quantifiers, which happens often in, in mathematics, you're gonna have statements that have a lot of alternations of quantifiers. Very hard to get a feeling for what that means. But if you think about it as a game, it's much more intuitive. And it's completely equivalent to think about quantifiers, go back and forth between quantifiers and games. Anyway, um, so let's look at the, at the reduction, the, the construction that shows uh, generalized geography is uh, complete. Took a little longer than I thought. Maybe this is, I just wanna make sure everybody's with me on this. So wh why don't we call the break now and then we'll come back um, and we'll look at the construction um, after that, because the construction itself is going to take about 10 minutes to, to work through, to figure out how to reduce TQBF and build a graph that simulates the formula. Okay, so I'm going to move right on to uh, the, um, and we'll come back. Okay, so feel free to ask some questions. Um, and uh, get ready for us diving in to a construction uh, for, the, um, uh, for the reduction of TQBF to generalized geography. So uh, there's kind of an interesting question about, you know, what's a relationship, you know, between a formula and when you swap the order of the quantifiers? Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the questioner is asking, does that somehow relate to the negating the, um, the, you know, the part, the quantifier free part, the part without the quantifiers. And I, um, I don't think that that's the right correspondence. There actually is uh, some relationship when you say, um, you know, there exists for all, is actually a stronger statement than, than saying that for all there exists. And in general, the, um, uh, that actually implies you know, exist X for all Y is a, it implies uh, for all Y there exists an X um, because what you're saying is that there is, 
the choice of y, if, if there exists an x uh, for all y, there is one x that works for every one of the y's. If you're saying for all y there exists an x, the choice of that x can depend on the y. Um, so there, there, there is a connection, but um, you have to think through what it means in order to understand that connection. Not, not, I, I, you, you won't need to know that in order to process what we're gonna be doing, but maybe it just helps you think about it. Um, other questions here? Okay, I think we're, um, we're out of time here. Uh, so let's return to our, um, our lecture. Um, so I'm gonna go back. Hopefully that won't crash everything. Uh, here we go. Okay, so now we're gonna be reducing TQBF to generalized geography. Are we all together now? Um, uh, okay. So I'm gonna illustrate this construction, which is a very nice construction, by the way. I'm gonna illustrate this construction just by doing an example of, or a partial example. Okay, but I think it'll give you the idea. So you understand, so what I'm trying to do here is I'm starting off with a quantified Boolean formula. So here it is. Um, I'm going to assume it's in conjunctive normal form, uh, which I can always convert it into that form, uh, maybe by adding some additional variables, but uh, without um, doing anything uh, too drastic to it. Uh, and so now what I'm going to, uh, starting from that formula, I'm going to now build a graph we're playing the geography game on that graph, which is remember taking turns, picking nodes, which may form a path, uh, is gonna to correspond to um, playing the formula game, which is picking the variables of that formula. And then you want uh, the, if the exist player wins in the formula, then player one is supposed to win in the geography game, okay? Um, so here is how the graph is going to look. Okay, so good to follow, try to follow this. Um, so it's going to be kind of, there's going to be kind of two parts. One that's going to correspond to the variables and the other part that's going to correspond to the clauses. Um, and so for each variable, I'm going to have like a diamond structure here. So there's a little starting thing that's going to be unique to the, to, to the first variable, but then Every variable is going to have like a little diamond structure here, um, and they're going to be attached one to the next. And we'll, we'll to understand how this, what this means um, when we play geography on this piece of the graph. So, but for, let's just understand the structure first. Okay. So this is the start node, and now um, here I'm player one is going to play the role of exist player two is gonna play the role of for all. And in fact, I'm gonna identify them. So I'm gonna call because it's gonna be helpful just to have, uh, helpful just to think about player one as being the exist player. So the exist player is gonna be playing on this graph. The exist and the for all players are gonna be playing on this graph. It's really just players one and two. So exist, the exist player, player one, has to, by, by the rules, has to pick the start node. And now at player two's move, these the for all players move. Now, if you're with me on this graph, the for all for, the for all players move um, is now not very interesting because it's forced. It has to go to here because again they're just picking the um, uh, the nodes of a simple path in, in this graph. So. The for all uh, player to the for all player has to go here, is if exist started over there. Now, um, now it's ex now it's the exist player's turn, and now the, now something interesting happens. The exist player has a choice; it can either go left or right. There are two possibilities. And then, after that, the for all player's turn. 
it was again just forced. So so far, for all has not had much interesting stuff to do in this. hasn't ha has not had to have, has not had to think hard. Um, so for all players, the no matter whether it exists when left or right, the for all players move is forced and ends up over here. And now it's the exist player's turn. Again, this is kind of an easy one. Oh, so before I do that, let's just look at how that play could go. So the first two moves is kind of I was suggesting. Exist goes here, and then for all goes there. I'm gonna I'm gonna illustrate kind of possible plays through this graph by tracing them out in green. Um, so now exist goes here, for all goes there. Those those were forced. But now the exist player goes could either go this way or could go that way. Okay. So those are two possible different ways of playing this, the game that we're set, we're building. Um, and now, uh, um, now whose turn is it here? This was the for all player picked this one. So the, the, the next turn is the exist player and that's forced. But now notice now for the first time the for all player has to think because the for all player can either go left or right. So it could either go left or it could go right. Um, um, and so then there's gonna be a sequence of these diamond structures where kind of they're constructed so that alternately either the exist has a choice or the for all player has a choice until you get the, all the way down to the bottom. Okay. That is the graph we've built so far. Now, if we stopped here, um, then whoever ended up at this point, whether it was exist or for all, would be the winner because there's nowhere for the other, for the opponent to go. Of course, that wouldn't be very interesting. So there's going to be more stuff we're going to add on, which are going to correspond to the clauses. Now, how to think about what's happened so far? Now, so maybe as some of you might be guessing, is that um, when the exist player over here has a choice, could have either gone left or right, that's going to correspond, because this is supposed to be mimic, mimicking the formula game, that's going to correspond to the uh, exist player in the formula picking the variable either true or false. So that the left or right is gonna to correspond to true or false. And so um, let's just arbitrarily say left is gonna to correspond to picking it true and right is gonna to correspond to picking false. Okay, so that, so the way I've said it so far is exist ended up picking the first variable false, then for all pick the second variable false, and the mth variable also got set false. Everything got set false so far. Well, who knows what happened in, over here, of course. Um, uh, okay, so just to understand what we've done so far. Now, I'm gonna show you how to build the rest of the graph. So let's take away the green part. Um, and now we're just back to the construction. The green part is actually how you use that construction. So back to the construction here. Now, what do we wanna achieve? Now, by the time the, the players on the graph have got down to here, they've effectively made an assignment to the variables by going either left or right at each one of these diamonds. So the assignment is done. From the game, from the perspective of the formula game, the game is over. And now one side or the other has won. Uh, here, we want to build some extra structure here as a kind of an end game to make sure that the for all player gets stuck if the exist player has made an assignment which satisfies the formula, satisfies this part of the formula. And the exist player should get stuck if the for all player, if the, if the assignment that they made uh, does not satisfy the formula. Okay, so let's see how we're gonna achieve that with some additional structure. So there's gonna be some extra node over here um, let me just tell you what the structure is and then we'll argue why it works. So there's gonna be 
going from this bottom node, we're going to start a kind of, um, you know, the second part of the graph is going to be a node which fans out to a node for each one of the clauses. And each one of those clauses in turn fans out to a node for each one of its literals. So you see we have clause C1 and it has the literals X1, X2 bar, X3, X1, X2 bar, X3. So there's a, no, a node for each of the literals in clause C1, same for clause C2 and so on. Now we're almost done. Now I'm gonna tell you how to connect up these literal nodes. So X1, each node is gonna get correspond back to its own diamond. So now we're gonna tie it back to the, the first part where we made the assignment, the assignment part of the graph. X1 is gonna connect back to the true part of the X1 diamond. And X2, because it's negated, is gonna tie back to the false part of the X2 diamond because it's an X2 variable. Similarly, X1 bar, now in, uh, you know, in, because X1 bar, you know, here's X1 bar in clause two, X1 bar um, is gonna connect up now to the full side of the X1 diamond. And X2 bar is gonna connect up to the full side of the X2 diamond and so on. So if we had, I don't have the other diamonds here, but the X4 would connect up to the true side of the X4 diamond, for example. That's the whole construction. Let's understand why it works, okay? So the end game here is we want exist to win um, if the assignment satisfied all the clauses. And for all should win if there was some unsatisfied clause. Okay, so why, why does this happen? So let's put back an assignment here that was made. So here is, here for the, in the one I'm, I'm putting back is, you know, the, the assignment that they cooperatively built had X1 being true, X2 being false, and some other stuff. Now, why does this work? So what we want to have happen now, now so now the move proceeds over to here, and you need to arrange it so that exist is the one who picks that node. If you have a, um, if you know, if you, you know, if this would have been for all, just add an extra node to switch who's, uh, whose turn it is. But you want to exist to be up here, and what you want is for all to be picking the clause, the clause node. Now here is, here is the part to understand what's going on. Um, we want for all to win if this is not satisfied. So the for, for all is gonna make a claim. Um, if this is not satisfied, there is some clause which is not satisfied. There's some clause which ended up being false in the assignment. So the for all player gonna say, I think I won. And I won because clause number one is unsatisfied. So it's gonna pick clause number one. So here's the four players weren't going, here's exist player. And so the four player picks the clause claimed unsatisfied. So over here, four player says clause C1 is unsatisfied. I'm gonna move here. Exist player says, uh-uh-uh, I don't agree with you. The assignment, uh, you know, you're, you're lying. Um, uh, the assignment actually makes one of the literals true in clause C1. Let's say it made X1 was true, as, it, as in fact it is here. X1 in fact is true. So exist is now its turn. It's gonna pick the, the literal that was true in the assignment in that clause that the for all player is claiming is unsatisfied. One of them is lying at this point. This is either now true in here which means a for all player did not pick an unsatisfied clause or the exist player picked a false literal, which is the, the, the exist player picked a false literal, which was the exist player's line. So now we're gonna, now the moment of truth, because let's see if exist go picked here, now it's um, the for all player's turn. 
it's connected back to the true side of the diamond. So that node was already used. That's the only place that for all could possibly go for all is stuck and, and exist has won the game, which is what you want because um, for all's claims were false and the, and the exist was, 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 was correct in saying that X1 satisfied clause C1. So X1 is true. So um, there's nowhere for for all to go, but compare that with a situation if the assignment on this part of the graph had gone through the false, had assigned X1 to be false. So the path had gone through the false side of the diamond. Now this node would still be unoccupied, un uh, would, would still be um, uh, available. So now the for all play, so if, if exist was claiming that X1 was true and it really was false, the for all player would be able to move onto that node. And now it's the exist player's turn and the exist would be stuck because this node down here is guaranteed to have been used. Okay, so that is the idea. It's really very beautiful. Um, and, and actually not that complicated. You have, to, you have to stare at it a bit. So let's just see what happens. For example, if um, you know, I had one other case, maybe it's not necessary at this point, um, but you know, if the for all player claimed well, it's the second clause which is unsatisfied in the mutually selected assignment. Um, then, uh, so this is sort of the the case where the for all player is, is correct. Um, you know, in, in that if the exist player now says, "Well, I think x one bar satisfied that uh, second clause," but you know this assignment made X1 true, so X1 bar is false, and so the exist player is lying this time. And so now the for all player can take this last edge and go here and has one, one last move to make and then the exist player is stuck. So the for all will win in that case. So let's turn now shifting gears entirely to a different um, uh, part of the space, you know, uh, 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 of space complexity instead of looking at polynomial space, which is like very powerful, we're gonna look at log space, which is comparatively speaking, much, much weaker. So log space are the things that you can do when you only have enough space to write down essentially a pointer or some fixed number of pointers into the input. That's what you get when you have logarithmic space. Um, and, um, you know, because log space is enough to write down an index of something. Um, so you can just, this is what you can do with a bunch of pointers. Uh, and uh, in order to make sense of this, we have to change the model of computation because if we use the ordinary one tape Turing machine, um, just scanning across the input, um, uh, will just reading the input with the way we've defined it would cost space N. And so you can't even read the input uh, if you have less than N space available like log space. Uh, so we're going to introduce a different model just to allow us to define this. And that's a model where it's going to be have two tapes where the part that contains the input doesn't count. And that's in order to make sure it doesn't, you know, it's not being cheated. The, the input tape is going to be read only, um, but it doesn't count toward the space used. Only the work tape, which is now has, can, re, can be read or, or written or read. Uh, is going to count toward the space bound. Okay, um, so now what we're going to define is, you know, using this definition for um, our space uh, complexity, um, we'll define space log n, the things that you can do if you have only a log amount of space here um, on the work tape. So the length of the input is n, the length of the um, uh, of the work tape is lo order log n. Um, so we have uh, the deterministic and non-deterministic associated classes, uh, space log n and n space log n. We're calling that L and NL, log space and non-deterministic log space. Okay, um, and as I said, that's just enough space to write down some pointers into the input. And let's do some quick examples. Um, so if you take the language of 
palindromes essentially, or WW reverse, um, that's in log space. Uh, so here's a string, I don't know, it was, here's a string that's in WW reverse. Um, and uh, I mean, the ordinary way you might use to test whether a string is of this form in WW reverse might be to cross off corresponding locations here, but you can't do that, it's a read-only input tape. So you have to somehow avoid writing on the input tape, but still testing whether you're in this language. It's not hard to do. You can use the work tape just to keep track of where your pointers would be. Um, and in so doing, you can just um, make sure you're matching off corresponding locations with each other in the input. Um, so log space, because of its ability to store some fixed number of pointers, it gives you enough to uh, test membership in this language. So this is in uh, this is solvable in log space. Uh, the path problem, which we've seen before, you know, you're given a graph and a start node and, and, and an ending node, or a start and a target. You're given a graph and S and T. It's a directed graph, and you don't can I know can I get from S to T? Um, so that problem is solvable in non-deterministic log space. Um, uh, because as um, the way we would do that, not, not writing this down in, in any detail, but uh, what you would do in your um, not, you know, non-deterministic log space machine, you have your input graph written here in the input, and you're just going to guess the sequence of nodes one by one, which takes you from the start node to the target node. You're not going to write down that whole sequence because that in advance because that would be cause you way too much uh, space to write down. The only space that you're going to use is to remember the current location where you're sitting. So you start out, you know, you write down on the work tape the start node. Then you're going to non-deterministically pick one of the outgoing edges from the start node and look at its associated node and replace that on your work tape and keep keep repeating that. If you ever get to the node T, then you can accept. And you also have to be a little careful. I don't have this on, on the slide. You also have to make sure that if the graph has a loop in it, because that's not allowed in space complexity. Uh, so you're gonna need also a counter to make sure that if you count up to, a, um, you've, you, 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 you've gone through a number of nodes which exceeds the total number of nodes in the graph, uh, then you can shut down that branch of the non-determinism uh, because you know it's you know just it's just going in a loop. Um, if there's any path that connects S to T, there's certainly going to be a path that has at most the number of nodes of the graph in it. Okay, um, so path is in NL. This language here is in L. In L. Um, what's the relationship between L and NL? Well, certainly. The deterministic class is contained in the non-deterministic class. That's all that's known. Whether these two collapse down to be the same is unsolved. And so we're going to spend a little time next lecture exploring this. Um, but but let's let's first um, look at some of the basic facts about log space. Um, sort of setting ourselves up for next lecture. So. First of all, anything that you can do in log space, you can do in polynomial time. In a sense, kind of trivially. And in a sense, we almost kind of really proved this already. Because if you remember, we said that anything that you can do in a certain amount of space, you can do in that much, uh, you can do in time in, that's exponential in the amount of space in the corresponding amount of space. So going from space to time blows you up exponentially. And order log n, the exponential of order log n is polynomial. So the way we're gonna prove this, and again, we kind of proved this already, um, but let's just go through it again, specific to log space. Uh, we'll say, and this is gonna be a useful definition for us anyway, um, a, a configuration for m on w. So we also we already talked about a configuration of a Turing machine M, which is just a snapshot, which is the tape 
the state and the head position. Um, when we have an input, which is sort of a uh, read-only input, which is not being counted toward the space, we don't include that in the configuration. Um, we just say it's a configuration of M on that particular input, but we're gonna be counting configurations. And I don't wanna count all the different inputs as well. I'm gonna fix the input and count all of the configurations relative to that input. Um, and uh, so the number of such configurations is just simply gonna be the number of states times the number of head positions for the two heads now times the number of possible tape contents. And which is, as I mentioned, here is the number of different possible tape contents. It's D, which is the tape alphabet to the uh, order log N. And that's just gonna be N to the K for some K. So it's gonna be polynomial. So that tells us that because the total number of configurations um, for M on W is polynomial, this machine can only be running for a polynomial number of steps. Otherwise it'll be looping. It'll be repeating a configuration. And so therefore that machine has to run itself in polynomial time. So you don't really in a sense have to do any work. If a machine is deterministically deciding a language in log space, it's also deterministically deciding the language in polynomial time because that's all the time you can use when you have log space, unless you're looping, which is not allowed. Okay, so therefore the same machine shows that you're also in P. Oh, I'll get to that in a second. One thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide when I'm talking about the model is by the way, this model is not so unreasonable um, uh, where you have kind of a, imagine having a very large read only input. And, and your local storage is much smaller. It's much too small to pull in the entire input. The way I used to explain this years ago was like you have a, your input is a CD-ROM, which I, you guys probably barely even have, know what it is anymore, but used to distribute software that way. So the ROM was like a, on a DVD uh, or a CD, which contained your, whatever you're trying to, like your software that you're trying to distribute. You know, it was some large thing uh, relatively. And so you would imagine having a smaller amount of memory relative to that. So you didn't want to necessarily copy that whole thing into your storage. Maybe even a better example now is like you think of the input as being the entire internet. Um, obviously you can't download, unless you're Google, you can't download the whole, you can't download the whole internet into your own uh, local memory, but you're going to have references, pointers into the input into different places. That's perhaps more analogous to this sort of read-only input Turing machine model that I'm describing. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, and it's another fact I wanna mention is that uh, I'm not gonna, Savage is the, anything that you can do in non-deterministic log space, you can do in deterministic uh, space, but now with a squaring. And that's using the same proof, that's using Savage's theorem which you have to check also works down to log space. Same proof. Um, so anything that you could do non-deterministically in log n space, you can use do deterministically in log squared n space. Okay, so let me just see if there's a couple of questions I wanna answer here. Um, uh, the relationship between L and NL is not known to be strict. Um, Nobody knows of an example. No one knows whether they're equal. Um, and uh, and have people looked at um, sublinear time classes? Yes, generally for, for when you have non-deterministic or probabilistic, which we're not haven't defined yet, but we will. Um, people have looked at um, those sublinear time classes as well. Deterministically, it doesn't make so much sense because then you can't even talk about the whole input. Um, okay, uh, let me move on. Um, okay, so this, uh, this is my last slide. Let me see if uh, we can do this before we break. Um, not only is L contained within P, but the much stronger statement is that NL is contained within P. And that we, you'll, that, for that, you'll have to do some work because converting your non-deterministic log space machine to a deterministic machine, um, obviously you're gonna to have to change the machine. Um, 
And so we'll introduce a new method here. Maybe we'll quickly go over this at the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, I don't like rushing through things at the end. Um, but for this, if, I, if I'm given um, a non-deterministic machine that runs in log space, I wanna make a new machine that runs in polynomial time deterministically for the same language. And I'm gonna define something called the configuration graph for M on an input W. And that's just, you take M and, it's, and W, its input, and you look at all of the configurations um, for M on W, actually configuration graph, is, actually that's, it should be called the computation graph. That's what it's called in the book, but okay, it's a typo here. I'll fix that next time. It uh, doesn't matter. Computation graph, configuration graph, uh, all the same. Um, basically, you're gonna take all of the configurations of M on W, of which we already observed only number, uh, or only polynomial in number, and may they become the nodes of a graph. And the edges connect to configurations if one follows another according to the rules of the machine. Okay, so here's a picture. These are, in, this is some graph. The nodes of this graph are the configurations of M on W, right? So the, each node here corresponds to the machine, a snapshot of the machine. A uh, tape contents, head position and state. Um, so writing down all those different configurations, I connect one to the other if I can get to CJ, CJ from CI in one step legally on the machine. And then uh, the non-deterministic machine M accepts W exactly when there's a path from the start configuration to, the, to, to, to an accept configuration. Well, let's assume we have just a single accept configuration as we argued we can do um, one or two lectures back. Um, if we clean up the tapes. So testing whether you can get from the start to the accept um, uh, is the same as testing whether the machine accepts its input. And so uh, because we can test whether there's a path and a graph connecting two nodes in polynomial time, we can solve this problem on this computation configuration graph in polynomial time and so we can figure out whether the non-deterministic machine accepts its input. Sorry, that came a little faster than I like to do. So we'll, 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 we'll see it again. Um, so here's the polynomial time algorithm. You construct the graph, you accept if there's a path from the start to the accept and you reject if there's not. Um, and so that tells us that uh, not only is L contained within NL, but NL itself is also contained within P. So here's a, here's a kind of a nice, a hierarchy of languages. We don't, not only do we not know whether L equals N, N L, we don't know whether L equals P. It's possible that anything you can do in polynomial time, you can do deterministically in log space, shocking as that might be, because it's a pretty weak class. But we don't know how to prove that uh, there's anything different, anything in P that's not in here. Um, last check-in. Uh, so we showed that path is in NL, What's the best thing we can do about the deterministic space complexity of path? So deterministic. So this is not a deterministic log space. What can we say deterministically about path? Um, hint: This should not be. This should not be hard. Uh, if you think back to what we've shown very recently. Okay. Get your check-in points. Closing up. Closing shop here. All set. One, two, three. Yeah, so the correct answer is log squared space because this is just Savage's theorem. We can do it in log space, not deterministically, so you can do it in log squared space deterministically. Okay, so that's, um, this is what we did today. Um, and I, as I mentioned, I will uh, do this again um, uh, on at Tuesday's lecture, just to recap that. All right, uh, so I'll stick around a little bit for questions. And um, okay, someone's asked to be about the nomenclature. Why is it L in the L space? Um, I, you know, because there's not really, people don't usually talk about L time. So L is sort of, everybody knows it's 
the only reasonable option is space. So people just say L and then L. Um, I mean, some of these things have had, you know, you know, these things, these names have a little bit evolved over time. And even now, some people say, talk about, uh, um, you know, I call it time classes. Some call, some people call it D time classes. You know, it's just, you know, it, it uh, you can make different choices there. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Good. Um, why does Savage's theorem work for log n? You have to you have to look back and see what you needed, um, and all you needed to be able to do was to um, write down uh, the configurations. Um, and uh, if you look back at how Savage's theorem works, you're just needing to write down the configurations. So the deterministic machine can write down the configurations for the non-deterministic machine. They take exactly the same size, and then you look at the recursion. And the uh, the depth of the recursion is going to be exponential in um, the size of the configurations, and so you're going to end up with a squaring again. You have to go back and just rethink that proof, and you'll see it, nowhere did it need a linear amount of space. It works down to log. It actually does not work for less than log n. Log n is sort of the lower threshold there, um, and the reason for that is because you also need to store the um, Input location and that already takes log space. Uh, the you know, not the 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 the, the head, tape heads. The tape heads already kind of um, have kind of a log space aspect to them. And so, if you're going to use less than log space, then funky things happen with the tape head storing the tape heads. And so, it, less than log space usually turns out not to be interesting. Uh, very specific to Turing machines and not sort of general. Uh, general models. Um, yeah, so somebody's asking, uh, suppose in the reduction um, to generalized geography from TQBF, if the formula had two exists in a row, um, then you would do kind of the natural thing in the graph. Instead of having that spacer edge between the two diamonds, you could just have one diamond connecting directly to the other diamond without a spacer edge. And that would be give you the effect. Um, of uh, not switching whose turn it is. Uh, somebody's asking me just a general question. Uh, are people thinking about these open problems? Um, I don't know. <laughs> people don't, uh, don't, don't say. Um, uh, there was a lot of work um, on problems related that seemed to be related to those uh, uh, those many open questions like P versus NP, L versus NL or L versus P and so on, P versus P space. We'll say, we'll talk a little bit more about some of that. There's some very interesting things that have been developed. I think there's a sense within the community that people are stuck and it's not, it's some, you're gonna need some sort of major new uh, idea in order to push the thing forward. So I don't know how many people are still thinking about them. Um, I hope people are because I would like to see the answer at some point, but uh, or get the answer. <laughs> I think about them sometimes myself, but um, one has to acknowledge chances of success are not high. Uh, okay, um, so we're a little after past the end of the hour here. Um, unless there's any other questions, if I didn't answer your question, I may have missed it, so you can ask again. Um, but uh, otherwise, I'm going to close this, close the session here. Okay, bye bye all. Have a good weekend. See you next week. Take care.